How would you like to prosper in whatever you do? In the book of Psalms, chapter 1, there's a promise. It says, whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now, what are the conditions of that promise? Well, listen. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. So the first condition is don't take the advice from ungodly people. Nor standeth in the way of sinners. Don't hang around them. Don't let them be your close friends and companions. Evil companionships corrupt good morals. Third, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. I don't want to be a scornful person. Scornful of God's word. Scornful of the authorities God has placed over me. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. There it is. Did you hear the promise? Whatever he does will prosper. It says he'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Now, here's a tree. I'll draw a tree that is prospering, flourishing. The leaves are not withering. And then I'm going to draw another tree that's far from prospering. Now, why is this tree over here, over there, not prospering, and this one is. Well, I haven't drawn the reason. The reason is this one is planted by the waters. It says, planted by the waters. Uh, another passage like this in Jeremiah 17. Blessed is everyone who trusts the Lord. Um, he'll be like a tree planted by the waters that spreads out his roots by the rivers. And he won't see when drought comes. His leaf will be green. It will not be careful in the year of drought. Neither will cease from yielding fruit. Now, this is like the person who trusts God, who, who meditates on God's word day and night. And whatever he does will prosper. This is like the person who trusts himself, trusts other people, maybe leaders, church leaders or others, and they'll fail him. Uh, yeah, but the Lord will never fail you. Now, could I ask you two or three questions? Is your faith like this or like this? How can you have strong faith? Well, the Bible says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If we will enjoy God's word and think it over day and night, hey, we'll have strong faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let me ask you a second question. Are you getting answers to prayer? Or is your prayer life pretty much like that? How can you have your prayers answered? Listen to what Jesus said in John 15. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done to you. Can you imagine? Asking for what you want and getting it. That's what he says. Ask what you will, and it shall be done to you. Here's, a, here's the conditions, though. If you stay with Jesus, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. So I've asked, is your faith like this or like this? The key is God's word. Is your, are you getting your prayers answered? Is your prayer life like this or like this? Let me ask you a third question. Is your happiness like this or like this? Hey, we can be happy if we will enjoy God's word. Blessed is the man who... Meditates on God's word day and night. Here's what Jeremiah said. And he was living in the worst of times. Terrible times. But he said, your words were found and I did eat them. And your word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Hey, you can be happy if you'll meditate on God's word. Now let me ask you another question. Is your usefulness in God's kingdom, are you barren and useless, unfruitful? Your life empty as far as bringing others into God's kingdom? Hey, I want to be fruitful. Herein is my Father glorified, Jesus said, if you bear much fruit. Well, how can you bear fruit? Remember, meditate on God's word, and you'll be like a tree planted by the river that brings forth fruit 
in season. I want to be a fruitful Christ Christian, and I can, and you can too. God's words, what's make, going to make the difference? Let me ask you one more question. Is your strength to overcome temptation, is it like that or like that? When you were little, did you ever climb a tree and step on a branch and it snapped? Yeah. How much temptation does it take to make you snap? How much pressure does it take before you fall into sin? How can it be strong? Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. The Apostle John said, he said, you, you young men, you're strong, and you've overcome the wicked one, and the word of God abides in you. That's the key. Let's meditate on God's word day and night. And we'll be like this tree, planted by the water, brings forth fruit in season. Leaf doesn't wither. And whatever you do will prosper. That's the word of God. In 1 Kings 18, we have a contest. A contest between the prophet Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Israel had turned away from God, turned to the worship of Baal. Ahab, the wicked king, was ruling Israel. His wife, maybe even more wicked, Jezebel, was the queen. Elijah prayed that it would not rain. God answered his prayer, and there was a drought, a famine, for three and a half years. Now the people, they're, they're suffering, man. And God has their attention. Now Elijah comes back, meets the king. He said, how long do you halt between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. Uh, you're going to limp between serving the Lord and then go back and serve Baal? Hey, make up your mind who you're going to serve. Serve him with your whole heart, not just halfway. And so Elijah told the prophets of Baal, he said, you make a sacrifice and pray for fire. Don't light a fire, just pray for a fire. And I'll make a sacrifice, and I'll pray for a fire. I'll pray to the Lord. You believe in Baal, you pray to Baal. And so, the prophets of Baal made their altar. They cut, they killed the, the bull. They skinned it. They put, put the, the meat on the altar, and they prayed. Now, those guys could pray. They prayed, they danced, they prayed a long time. Doesn't it impress you when somebody has a long prayer? Well, the prophets of Baal had a long prayer. They prayed from morning till noon. They prayed on past that. They began to cut themselves. Sometimes people think if they can make God feel sorry for them and, and punish themselves and cut themselves sometimes or beat themselves or fast a long time just to get God's attention. Finally, Elijah began to make fun of them. He said, why don't you pray louder? Is your God deaf? Maybe he's run off on some errand. Maybe he's sleeping. You need to wake him up. Finally, they're defeated. Everybody can see they're defeated. They prayed. No fire comes. And now it's Elijah's turn. And he gathered some stones. Twelve stones. He repaired the altar of God. He cut the wood, killed the bullock, and laid this bullock on the altar. And then he did a strange thing. He asked him to dig a trench around the altar. He said, pour some water in. Now, they don't have much water. It's been a famine for three and a half years. But they pour four barrels of water get the wood soaking wet now if you want fire you don't want dry you don't want wet wood but hey Elijah's going to get a fire god can burn wet wood as good as he can dry wood he said pour four more barrels of water on they poured four more 
He said, do it again the third time. And now the altar, the wood, the meat, everything soaking wet. And Elijah prays. Doesn't pray a very long prayer. If you read it, you could read it in about a minute, maybe a half a minute. You know, Jesus said when you pray, don't use vain repetitions. God knows what you want before you even pray. You go to some churches or some places and someone prays and he just makes such a long speech. And that doesn't impress God. Elijah prayed. It wasn't a very long prayer. <laughs> but then God sure answered it. He just said something like this, Lord, let everybody know that you're God, that I'm your servant. I've done what you said to do. Turn the people back to you, O Lord. And when he prayed that little prayer, a wonderful thing happened. The fire of God fell. It burned up the bull, burned up the wood, burned up the stones, burned up the water. Man, you talk about a fire. You see, it wasn't just that he knew how to pray a fancy prayer. It wasn't just some form he had. The power of God was there. The Bible says some people have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of it. The Bible says turn away from those people. You see, you can go to church and believe the right stuff, believe that sign the right doctrinal statement, and you can sing the right songs, and you can shout, and you can wave your hands, and you can go through all the motions. You can have a good form. I want to ask you a question. Is that all you have? Just a form. Elijah had more than just the form. He had the power. Now, a lot of people talk about power. I've heard people talk about praying for healing. I claim that it's done. Yeah, but the person didn't get healed. There's enough of, enough of empty talk. The Bible says, turn away from people who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. When you get saved, there's a change. You don't just pronounce some words. If you're really saved, the Bible says, and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. You see, if you're really saved, God's spirit is there with you and you can obey. You can love your enemies. Love your enemies, your enemies. You don't just love the people that are nice and good looking and rich and are generous to you. If you're saved, you love your enemies. You obey. You obey whether it's convenient, whether it's not convenient. You obey when people are watching you. You obey pe when people are not watching you. That's how you can tell if you're saved. There's a change. Hey, so you have the right form, but is the power there? Has there been a change so that now you're loving your enemies? You're obeying in secret as well as in public, obeying the, go, those who God has placed over you, obeyed God to turn away from uh, sexual sins and lust, fight that temptation and overcome that sin even in your own heart and mind. Are you kind and generous or stingy and keeping it all for yourself? I'm saying, is there a change? You see, we do have the power to overcome sin. And God answers prayer. That's a, another kind of power. I've seen God provide several years ago. In fact, it was almost exactly 20 years ago. 20 years ago this month, I think, maybe next month. I'd been preaching for a good many years, didn't have a car. When I needed a car, I borrowed one from my dad. But I found out <laughs> you can have God's power without much money. You don't have to have a lot of money to see the power of God. But now I prayed that God would give me a car, and he gave me one. Didn't cost me anything. I have seen God guide me, things I did not know, and he supernaturally guided me. And I could look, I could look back afterwards and see how God had guided me on things I did not know, sometimes I could not have known. I have seen God heal sometimes in answer to prayer. Now, I don't have the gift of healing, I don't think. Not everyone has the different gifts. 
Don't feel bad if you don't have this gift or that gift. Just like you have different parts of the body, your mouth is not supposed to see. Your mouth is supposed to eat and talk. Your eye is not supposed to be able to handle and, and, and walk. And so, if you don't have the gift of healing, if you don't have the gift of prophecy, if you don't have the gift of tongues, relax, do what you can do. But you see, some people have got the idea that Christianity doesn't have any miracles, doesn't have any answers to prayer. Now, I don't have the gift of healing, but I've seen some God answer prayer and seen people healed. I could spend a, a long time telling answers to prayer, supernatural answers to prayer when God has provided or healed or helped in a way that I could not have done myself. I've never seen anybody raised from the dead. But I have two friends, uh, several friends actually, but two different, two different occasions. A, a close friend of mine, I've known him for many years. I've known his wife since I was a boy. And they prayed for someone who died. And God raised them up. I have another good friend, several friends who, who witnessed this. In Indiana, a little church in Westville, Indiana, a man died at prayer meeting. And some of the men prayed and God raised him from the dead. You see, God's just the same as he was back in the Old Testament, back in the New Testament. Is your godliness just a form or is the power of God there? I have, seen, I have seen supernatural judgments on people who have hindered God's work. A house burned down or destroyed by a tornado. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen other kinds of judgments on people who have, who have fought against God's work. You see it in the Bible. God is not, is not any different. Uh, people would cast out demons. You see the devil's still around, don't you think? Uh, he's died and all the demons are gone and we need to have power and we can have power over the enemy over all the power of the enemy how about angels now I've never seen an angel as far as I know I know they are around us I have a good friend I've known him for oh, 34 years and he tells me and his daughter told me the same story how God protected his little grandson her son just a about a year and a half old, I think. He was there sitting on the back of the back of the car, on the back bumper. And the mom didn't know it. She's driving off down the highway. And God protected the little boy. Amazing. Afterward, they asked him if he had seen anything. If they, they figured God must have sent an angel. They said, did you see anything? <laughs> he said to his mom, yes, ma'am. He said, what did you see? A big boy. This little boy, his name is Mike, Micah. He calls uh, boys, little boys, and he calls men, big boys. So he, saw, he said he saw one, someone sitting there with him. Nobody else saw anybody there with him. He said a big boy, what, he, what we'd call a man. And they said, did he say anything to you? Micah said, yes, ma'am. They said, what did he say? The little boy said that, that this angel, he didn't call him an angel, said the angel said to him, I hold children. That's the way the little boy said it. You see, God had sent an angel there to protect that innocent, helpless little boy that didn't have any better sense than to get, get off the back of the car when it's going to drive down the highway. You see, God is just the same. God's power is no different. Do you need help? There's a God who hears and answers prayer. Uh, let thy work appear unto thy servants and thy glory unto their children. That'd be a good prayer to pray. Psalm 90. Verse 16, you have a form of godliness? Is it just an empty form or is the power of God there? Was there a change in your life? Have you ever seen any answers to prayer? Are you having victory over sin? Now here's a big one. Jesus said in Acts 1.8, you will receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you'll be witnesses to me. At home in Jerusalem, in the next area, in the next area, and then all the way to the uttermost parts of the earth. Let me ask you a question. Is there any power? Have you seen the power of God in changing people, bringing them to repentance and faith in Jesus? If you ask God to give you his spirit, you can see his 
power. Listen to it again. You'll receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you'll be witnesses to me. Have you seen the power of God? The power, and that's the big thing. This is bigger and better than healing someone. Healing some, somebody's wonderful. You know it is, especially when you're sick. You want God to heal you. I do, and other, anybody uh, with good sense would want that. Yeah, but this is bigger and better. If you get somebody saved, that's better than healing. It's even better than raising them from the dead. Hey, man, you're rescuing them from the lake of fire. Elijah saw the power of God. You have the power of God to win people to the Lord. You'll receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you'll be witnesses to me. So there's a contest. Elijah against the prophets of Baal. Elijah was not disappointed. He prayed. Was it a long, fancy prayer? No, just a pretty simple, straightforward prayer. Short. Hey, are you seeing God's power in your own life? Get any prayers answered? Are you having victory over sin in your own life? Are you seeing other people come to the Lord? If you're seeing the power of God in your life, then your children have an advantage, a head start, to help them to see that Christianity is not just a form, not just a rigmarole, not just words. Turn from any sin that's going to hinder God's power, hinder answers to prayer, and you can have God's help, God's mercy, and God's power. Let me tell you about several men who actually saw Jesus when Jesus was here on earth. That would be special. How would you like to see Jesus raise somebody from the dead? Well, this man I want to talk about first saw many wonderful miracles. His name was Judas, Judas Iscariot. He was really a privileged guy. He heard Jesus preach and teach lots of times. In fact, he could preach himself, evidently work miracles. Jesus sent his disciples out, they worked miracles. But he never did really turn from his sinful way. But they thought he was good. I know they thought he was good because they made him the treasurer. He held the money bag. When they took up a collection, they gave the money to Judas. When no one is looking, Judas would get into the money and keep some. Money that was supposed to go to the poor. But he could sing. He could pray. And he could preach. But he hadn't even turned away from his own sinful way. One night, he got angry. That's something Jesus said. He went out into the darkness. He found some other men who also hated Jesus. They were religious, as Judas was religious. Fakes, but religious. They gave him 30 pieces of silver. Judas loved money. He'd rather have a little money now than be rescued from everlasting fire. Well, the men got some sticks, swords, followed Judas out into the darkness to arrest Jesus. Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss. But when Judas saw that they decided to kill Jesus, man, he knew he had done a terrible thing. Here they are at the priest's house abusing Jesus. They condemned him to death. So Judas brought the money back, the 30 pieces of silver. He said, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. They said, oh, we don't care. You see about that yourself. Judas threw the money down there in the temple. He went out and hanged himself. When he hanged himself, evidently the rope broke because the Bible says he fell down headlong his bowels gushed out. Well, that's a pretty shameful end for a preacher. Judas was a preacher. But you see, it wasn't really his end. You're not like a dog, a 
a chicken, you kill it, and that's the end. Every one of us, made in the image of God, will spend forever, either in heaven, pleasure forever, or in torment in a lake of fire. Well, Ju Jesus was crucified between two thieves. A thief on one side, a robber. A thief on the other side. Back then, if they caught thieves, sometimes they'd just kill them. Bet they wouldn't steal anything else, would they? The priests were making fun of Jesus. And the soldiers. They said he saved others, he cannot save himself. The robbers also made fun of Jesus. But after a while, one of them changed his mind. Here he is bleeding to death. He's about to face God. He said to the other robber, don't you fear God? We're getting what we deserved. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to that criminal, today you will be with me in paradise. Hey, Jesus is going to take him to heaven. Jesus died. Later that day, the soldiers came and broke the legs of the two criminals. They're still alive, see? When they broke his legs, it was too much. It killed him. But suddenly, he did not feel any more pain. In fact, he felt pretty good. He never had felt this good before. Well, his body was dead. It did not feel anything. But his spirit has gone to be with Jesus in paradise in heaven. Why? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The soldiers broke his legs. He's probably cursing and swearing, but there's nothing he can do. The pain kills him. But suddenly, he's in a worse pain, a fiery, burning pain. He's been there for almost 2,000 years. Why? Well, he's being punished for his sins. Yeah, but this man committed sins too. Yes, but he turned to Jesus for mercy. Jesus took his punishment. He took his punishment too. But this is the one who called on the Lord. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, they took the dead body of Jesus down, put it in a tomb, after they'd wrapped it in a long white cloth. Three days later, some of the ladies who loved Jesus, who believed in him, they came down to the garden to put some spices and perfume on the body of Jesus to show their love and respect. As they got close to the grave, they said to each other, who's going to roll that stone away? It was too, too big for those ladies to move. When they got there, they saw the grave was open, and they were scared. And then they saw that the grave was empty. Now they're even more afraid and confused. Then they saw an angel. He said, he's not here. He's risen, like he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. Those ladies went running. They told the men. The men did not believe those ladies. But two of them went running to the grave themselves. Peter and John. John was faster. He got there first. He stooped down. He looked in the grave. And those women were right. The grave was open and empty. They, he saw the body, excuse me, he saw the cloth that had been wrapped around the body, but the body of Jesus was gone. John remembered what Jesus said. He said, in three days I'll rise again. And John believed. Well, the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now watch. Here are four men. Here's Judas. He was a disciple well, he looked like one, but secretly he continued his sinful way. Then here's two thieves, two robbers. Yes, but one called on Jesus. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And here's John. He saw, he believed. If you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Why don't you be like this man and ask Jesus to save you? He'll save you as well. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved.